Hi, this is Tim and Joel. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. Iowa-Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s. Located in historic Keosauqua, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. Uh, welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Uh, we have a very special guest today, but before we get to that, uh, I want to talk first about our subscribers. As we've been having uh, a large increase in, our, in the number of sponsors that we've gotten, Joel, and pretty happy. So I think I think we must be doing something right with regards to what our listeners want to want to hear, and and uh, we've been doing a great job, and we. We've been continuing to leverage the Iowa DNR uh, for their vast uh, resources and knowledge to, to help us. So um, we're going to do that again today. But again, back to our subscribers. Thank you for taking the time to listen, listen or watching our show. Uh, we do this for you. And uh, if this is your first time as a listener or a viewer, what well, we'd appreciate if you like what we're doing, give us a subscribe. You see in our lower right-hand corner of our uh, on our YouTube video, you can just click, you mouse over that, and click subscribe, and uh, that really helps us. And uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Parlor, Instagram, soon to Rumble. Uh, so uh, again, thank you very much. And so then, <laughs> so then now, going on to Joel, and hey, let's talk about our sponsors. Yeah, just a quick shout out to our sponsors, because you've already watched those if you're watching on YouTube. But again, just a shout out to Pete Shorty's in Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa, and IMH Aaron in Kiyosakwa. Uh, if you have any seed, fertilizer, plant questions, um, which it's early March, people are really gearing up for that, give Aaron a call. Um, he is the man. He is the food plot Scientologist. Yeah. And I think we have another sponsor coming on board, but we'll leave that hanging for right now. Uh, and it might be in this episode or it might not, but we'll talk about uh, them uh, down the road. Sounds good. But we are in, uh, like I said, early March. And uh, unlike the last episode where we did where it was 10 degrees and 10 days of 10 degrees or less, uh, it's like record highs today of going to be 72. It's 60 degrees early March in Iowa. It's like summer. It yeah, is summer. Love it. Yeah. But we are in uh, Sheraton, Sheraton, Iowa, and uh, the state park here, and uh, the DNR has a research center here, and I'm happy to introduce and honored to be here with uh, Jim Coffey. And Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and what you specialize in. Yeah, so uh, I, I grew up in Southern Iowa, actually about 10 miles from where we're at right now. So uh, I've got a great affinity for uh, oak hickory deciduous forests and, and the landscape that this part of the state provides. It's much more unique than other parts of the state of Iowa, and I encourage people to travel the entire state to see how unique we really are down here. Um, went to school to Iowa State University a long time ago um, and got a degree in Fish and Wildlife, and then uh, went and worked for the state of Idaho for a while, and then I was out in New York doing some wild turkey research with the university out there, um, and then was lucky enough to come back and get a job literally 10 miles from where I grew up at, so that's pretty unique in, in our profession. We tend to move uh, where the jobs are at, you never know where you're going to end up at. So I've been around turkeys my whole life, literally caught my first turkey when I was about five, um, some of the reintroductions that were going on in this area, and have always um, enjoyed the the forest wildlife species, which is what my job title is. I'm a forest wildlife biologist. So I deal with turkeys as a turkey program coordinator, but also help out a lot with the deer um, 
the deer issues in the state of Iowa. I've done some CWD coordinating for a few years and uh, wear lots of hats, love squirrels, absolutely love squirrels, rough grouse. Um, and, the, and the feral hog coordinator for the state of Iowa. And uh, recently I put the hat on of the armadillo biologist for the state of oh Iowa. Oh my so, gosh. Oh, we, we're going to have to talk. So just yeah, like yeah. Tyler, you have one of those asterisks at the end of your title other, without description that says anything your boss tells you you want absolutely. to do. Absolutely. Right? Other duties as assigned. And, and then it kind of, not to, not to brag upon myself, but because I've been around for quite a while, I get a lot of the what did it used to be like questions and why did we do this questions because we're getting a much younger a group of people coming in and there's a lot of history there so I kind of am the historian for a little bit of some of what we do and why we've done it over the years. Doesn't mean we'll always do it the same way but it's kind of a nice ground check to go back and say how come we started this or how come this was this way. Um, so I love all things to do with our forest in Iowa. I'm not a trained forester but I love um, working with our forestry staff and learning from them and understanding how and why we manage. Um, because what we really manage in Iowa is habitats. Um, we, we talk about managing species. We don't manage the species. We manage the habitats. And, and I always like to say, and if we build it, they will come. Um, and if we build good habitats, those species that are associated with those habitats will do well. And that's what we try to do um, on a sweet species with lots of different wildlife. Yeah, that makes sense. Excellent. So. I'll I'm the master digressor, Jim. So let's get the digressions yeah, out, that's out of the way right, right away. So you said a couple things right here that just piqued my interest. Yeah. So feral hogs. Feral hogs, yeah. Do, do, we, do we have feral hogs? So really, no, we don't. Good um, answer. Yeah, and, and, and we, we had a few hog issues um, 15 years ago or so uh, when there was a big push with Russian boars and people moving Russian boars around trying to create additional hunting opportunities. And what we see in the South now is, is those people that thought that that was a good idea realized how bad of an idea it really was. And luckily in Iowa, we were, we were kind of on the edge that we never got into that too much. Uh, most of the hogs we see now are really domesticated hogs that have escaped, which could become feral. And that's a tough definition for us uh, in the state of Iowa because livestock belongs to somebody. Um, so when we talk about feral wild pigs, we're typically talking about the Russian boars and the things that we see down south that are on a lot of videos that people want to go hunt. Um, but we're also talking about domestic hogs that have escaped. And we work with the Department of Ag on those when I'm trying to get those situations taken care of. So, but somebody has to be the coordinator. Somebody has to understand what's going on and, and what's happening because it is a big issue to our south. Sure. Yeah, yeah, Missouri especially. So I gotta ask about the armadillos. Yeah, I was like, hold on to the armadillos. Oh, we're gonna hold on to the ar we'll come back, the armadillos will come back in, but let's talk about. That's probably a whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna put a little star by the armadillo because we'll talk about that in this episode for sure. But let's get into turkeys. Sure. Let's talk turkey, right? Yeah. So, um, you, you know, from an Iowa standpoint, have turkeys always um, been in the state of Iowa? So, so yes. So pre-settlement, when we talk uh, pre-statehood in 1846, we had great turkey numbers. But what we know is, is that as, as European settlement occurred, there's some great photographs, if you ever get a chance to go to the Mississippi River Museum, to look at uh, those historical photographs of what those river bluffs looked like. We decimated our oak hickory timbers. We used all that lumber to build railroads and to, and to pioneer. Um, and in, in turn, when we destroyed the habitat, we lost the wildlife associated with that. So the last turkey was actually seen in Lucas County, where we're at now, in about 1910. Uh, last documented wild turkey. And then we went through the 60s without having wild turkeys. My grandfather never saw a wild turkey <coughs> until the 60s. And then there was a nice effort by the, back then, the Iowa Conservation Commission and a lot of other states at that time because turkey population had been decimated across the nation. Um, just really a, a, some small uh, holdings in the south, southeast, where turkeys were abundant and not even abundant at historical levels. Um, and so there was a push to try to bring them back, and, and Iowa Conservation Commission was part of that. But we didn't know much about turkeys. There weren't any turkey biologists at that time. We just kind of, you know, well, this might work that much. Work. And of course, people thought about reintroducing domestic birds, and we quickly learned that that didn't work, and it just wasn't going to be a way to do it. But we also, at that time, weren't sure, but there were different subspecies. And our closest subspecies was our neighbors to Nebraska that have a different subspecies, the Merriams, which grows up in short grass prairies and is associated with those habitats. Well, they were willing to give us some. 
So they gave us some, and we stuck them into Yellow River State Forest, you know, the most dense, best timber habitat we had in the state. So that would be like taking you out of Albi, Iowa, and saying, let's go to New York. <laughs> we'll just drop you in the middle of New York and see how you do. <laughs> so I'm sure that these grassland, you know, dry species turkeys that were dumped in the middle of the Yellow River State Forest go, this isn't, a, this isn't Kansas anymore, you know. And they didn't do well, is my point. And after several of those attempts that failed, we got some eastern subspecies, which is what we have now and have and had historically from Missouri. They were reintroduced into Yellow River and Chimney State Forest, and they did really well. And they did so well that we thought, wow, our original goal was we just want to have some turkeys back on the landscape for people to be able to see and know that they're part of the Iowa heritage. And they were doing well. And so we started saying, well, let's trap and move some of our own birds. And we started moving them across the state. And then there was talk about maybe we could even have a season someday, you know, a very limited season. And fast forward to 2021, we will probably harvest turkeys in 99 counties this year. We'll probably have next to historic level huntable numbers again um, in just a matter of less than 50 years. Wow. So just a huge, huge increase. Two, two uh, questions mm -hmm. pairing off what you said. Uh, we've talked about Marians, we've talked about Eastern. Yeah. I know there's a third species. There's actually five subspecies. Okay. Yeah. So the Eastern subspecies, which is what we have, um, basically goes from the Missouri River all the way back to the East Coast, um, clear north into, into Canada now, because it's been introduced into Canada, which traditionally thought it couldn't survive that far north, and then of course clear down into the south. When you get clear down to the south, there's another subspecies called the Osceola or Osceola turkey, which is only found in Florida, really the, the southern two-thirds of Florida. And then as you get past Missouri, we're kind of on the edge there with the Missouri River, we just use that as a hard, a hard <laughs> line, you get into the Miriams, which is a much drier species of bird. Um, and then you get down into the south and Texas with the Rio Grande. Um, and then you can get down into Arizona where we have the Goulds, uh, which is really the last uh, subspecies. Yeah. But, but these turkeys have been moved all over the countries now, and there's actually some eastern turkeys out in Idaho and Washington where the elevations are right and conditions are, are favorable, which would not have traditionally been there um, years ago. I got to tell you, I forget my wife's cousin has, uh, they had just introduced some birds up by where he lives, up in, uh, it's right near the Canadian border, mm -hmm. and they are prolific. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. They're seeing some of the same um, um, booms that we saw probably back in the 70s, and these are birds that are being introduced into places they hadn't been, and they're usually in, in good agricultural areas again, they're adjusting well. Um, it's kind of a balance between adjusting between the sociology of the people in the area sure. and, and people protect them for a while because it's new and it's, it's neat to have them on the landscape and then they're going to be calling their local DNR and going, <laughs> I got to make them, what do we need to do with these? So, um, but, but turkeys, um, it, it'll come up with Iowa too, they, they do have a limiting factor with smoke <coughs> um, and typically uh, there were studies back in the 70s by Dr. Porter who was my major professor um, in Minnesota is how far north would turkeys be in Minnesota. And what we started to find out is they do well in agricultural areas, but really snow depth starts to become their main factor. And it's not that they can't <coughs> walk on top of the snow, um, it's when the snow is fluffy. And we started to see is when turkeys get into about 10 or 12 inches of fluffy snow, where they're actually kind of plowing and pushing through that snow, it limits their mobility. <coughs> and it doesn't mean that they can't survive, it's just that they have to be in position places that provide them different winter type covers and habitats. So much energy to fix to just to move around. Just to move around to find and feed. So they'll 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 get associated with agriculture obviously and then they'll associate with pine trees, which is something we don't talk much about. And we could talk about that in a different episode about habitat and, and the impacts of pine trees, especially a year like this that could have a turkey. When, when was Iowa's uh, first turkey season? First turkey season nineteen seventy four. Yeah, so our introductions were in the mid-60s, so in less than about 10 years, we started having our first season. It was a draw only, um, and I'm, you're going to tax my memory, but I think there were 400 tags issued, um, of which I think there was about a 100 birds harvested. Now I'm, I know I'm wrong. I am aging myself. I can't remember exactly. But it was going to be almost like a once-in-a-lifetime deal, and, and it was only open in the three state forest areas, and that'll be the only place you know that we're going to really see these birds, and that wasn't the case. Wow, how things yeah. have changed. It's changed a lot. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's the shift. Um, let's talk about today. Um, what 
does the turkey population in Iowa look like? So, so turkey populations in reality are very difficult to measure and monitor. Um, in, in fact, deer and Tyler would argue with me, Tyler Harm or deer biologists, <laughs> I tend to think deer are easy because they're big and they stand out the middle. And they're there and hey, count me. Count yeah, me. exactly. Right? Make sure you get me back. Yeah. Um, but turkeys, uh, it's one of the biggest troubles we've had as turkey biologists is to come up with a good sensing technique to see. And then they're, they're basically what we call there's R and K species, the species that produces a lot of young but has a lot of die off, versus a species that produces few young and survives longer. Turkeys are kind of in that in-between area. They produce a lot of young with a lot of mortality and there can be a lot of turnover in four or five years. So it's hard to get a, a real good handle on the population. I'm giving you a biological answer. I get it. I get it. But in reality is we've got good turkey numbers um, but they can fluctuate a lot in, in just a short amount of time and so that's why habitat is critical to turkeys is to kind of smooth out those ebbs and flows because sure. we want to have good production all the time and some years we'll have really good production in a few years we may have really bad production but in a couple of years it'll bump itself back up so so we were talking about how difficult it was to get uh, turkey numbers can yeah. we dwell into that just a little more? yeah so we don't really go out and survey turkey populations themselves what we look at is productivity and that's we do a, a summer brood survey and we're looking at the number of hens that we predict were successful nesters and then the number of offspring or poults that survived that nesting season. And so we ask um, really anybody in the state of Iowa, but, but specifically we have um, brood survey uh, volunteers that will, during the month of July and August, just when they see a turkey, will record that that they saw a hen or they saw a gobbler or they saw a hen with three poles or this. And then that gets reported back to us. And we break that down then regionally to look at the nine agricultural regions of the state of what productivity looks like around the state to give us a general gauge of, by region. And then we'll um, accumulate that together and say this is a general overall what happened in the state last year. It doesn't tell us that we've got this many turkeys, it says that productivity was higher or lower than previous years and say we would expect this to be happening with the population. So as part of that survey, if you will, uh, do people leverage trail cameras for that as well? Or is that We haven't incorporated that and, and we, we asked that if you get a picture on a trail camera, you can obviously report that. But what ends up happening is that what we want then is not that same brood to be reported multiple times. Sure. So like if you know you've got a trail camera out, it's odds are that those are probably the same turkeys in that area. So if you see a hen with four poults, and two days later you see a hen with four poults, and three days later you see a hen with four poults, it's really not three hens with four poults, it's one hen with four poults. You know, what I usually see is, is in my place, is I'll see a hen with five poults, and then the next picture is a hen with four poults, and then a hen with three poults. Yeah, the, the next day. <laughs> and, and so then we rely on your scientific capability to say, is that the same hen with less poults, or is that three different hens with three different broods? With a couple yeah. bobcat pictures. Yeah, a little bit. So, and, and we realize that that happens. So that's why a lot of this is just a snapshot in time. Sure. And, and what it ends up showing us sometimes, and, and there's, it, it's really hard to put together, but is that when you have a lot of hens that are productive, you're going to have a lot of loss. But you may, it, I call it the schooling effect, and you'll actually see this. Is you might not see one hen with four, one hen with three, one hen with two. You might see one hen with four, two hens with eight, three hens with 12, yeah. because they'll start gang brooding. And as they start gang brooding, it's like, it's like having children and taking them to the playground. There's the same amount of parents, but it's a lot more eyes watching all those kids run around the playground trying to keep them safe versus one parent trying to watch the kids run around. Yeah, so safety and numbers. Them, it's a schooling effect, safety and numbers. Is yeah. there any new technology or any new methods um, starting to be used, uh, experimented with to, to get a better handle so on the number of So actually back in the 90s, I was trying to, to work on using infrared technology. Um, where we could uh, find uh, turkeys roosting in the wintertime and, and fly over them and count them with infrared. But that was back with what was called a FLIR unit, which was on an airplane, which is expensive. And now, fast forward 40 years, you have the same thing on the bottom of a, a drone. Excuse me, on the bottom of a drone. So we're always pushing what's available, what can we do. But then it becomes hard as how do you do that on a scale? Mm 
Yeah. And, and right now we're looking at those bigger issues. So the two ways that we survey turkey numbers really is that July, August brood survey. And then we use our fall bow hunters. That fall bow hunter observation survey is so important because it gets that gauge of what has been produced throughout the year. We just have the same issue with bow hunters is try not to count the same group of turkeys multiple, sure. multiple times going through. So the beauty too with turkeys is, is they don't like each other. They segregate themselves. <laughs> so those adult males will segregate themselves from the young of the year and the hen. So, you know, you, you can see that and, and count that out and we can look at those kind of numbers and try to interpret what we think. Yeah. But I say interpret because it's not a hard count. It's not an accounting of what's going on. It's a trend of what we see happening out there. Mm-hmm. What is the, you know, what's the state, what's the DNR saying about the state population of turkeys? Up, yeah. down, same? What? So so I try to, I'm a pessimistic optimist, is it's never as good as it could be, but it's always better than it <clears throat> was, is we've got good turkey numbers. But if you're a longtime turkey enthusiast or turkey hunter, you're not seeing the turkeys you saw 15, 20 years ago. Um, but but by today's standards, you're still seeing good numbers. It's just really, that's why we break it down the nine ag regions. Um, in central Iowa, we're doing really well. You know, in this, in this zone um, where we're at right now, our numbers are really consistent and doing well. Um, southeast Iowa has been going down for 10, 15 years. Southwest Iowa has been going down. And those are issues we're trying to figure out why is that trend happening? But it's not just happening in Iowa. It's happened in Northeast Missouri. It's happened in Illinois. In fact, it's happening in Arkansas and Tennessee and every yeah. place else. Yeah. Right. I've been doing a lot of reading. And, yep. uh, and so it's got a lot of head scratching going on with all the turkey biologists because we've all got good numbers, but they're not what they used to be. And, and it's been this gradual down. So is that, a, is that a change in habitat? Is that a change in landscape usage? What's happening? Or is it just the fact that turkey numbers just exploded through the 80s and 90s, and now they're actually kind of metering themselves out to something that's a little more realistic on the mm-hmm. landscape. What's your theory? Um, in mm-hmm. Iowa, I've got a couple of theories. Is We, we heavily manipulate our landscape. Um, we're the most manipulated landscape really in the world, and agricultural programs change that, and land ownership changes that. Just like you guys, I'm sure you bought your land and you want to change it. You want yep. to do something with it to make it this or that. But a lot of that lands on a pretty small scale, you know, maybe 40, 120, 300 acres. And you're talking about species that use 320 to 640 acres. So we don't ever really control enough of that land to be able to just say, okay, these turkeys are, are reacting to what I've done. They're sure. reacting to the land around me. My personal theory is, is other than ag programs and how we've shifted and, and manipulated the usage of the land, is we don't manage our timber well in Iowa. We don't have an ethic of managing our timber well. We've used our timber for different reasons than other places do. Um, And we actually are seeing the byproduct of not, I don't want to say not harvesting, but some of the bad things that we saw in the 70s, you know, some of the Smokey the Bear campaigns and some of those things about cutting a tree is bad and we can't do this and we can't do that. We're paying that price today. Most of our timber, and I'm sure you talk with Jeremy Cochran, most of our timber is well overstocked. There's too much timber on the landscape for what the, it should be producing and how quickly we could get it producing acorns and providing layers of habitat into it. Um, but most of us grew up with that timber's good. You see timber, it's green, that's yeah, good. A tree's a tree. A tree's a tree, yeah. we didn't manage it. Yeah. So I put it, and this is me and my naivety, but I put it in terms of we're really good with agriculture in Iowa. We understand corn, we understand beans, we understand cows. And, and I used to put it this way is that and, and, and my numbers are probably off because I haven't farmed for a long time. But let's just say we plant 30,000 kernels of corn an acre, you know, to raise 200 bushels of corn. Well, if I do the simple math, why don't I just plant 60,000 kernels of corn and get 400 bushels? And the first response you'd get out of farmer is that doesn't work. You can't do that. Well, we can't do that with trees either. We can't overstock our trees and expect them to produce and to do the things that they need to be doing. That's a good analogy. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So we just really have to look at if we want to manipulate our landscape. And there's nothing wrong with not doing anything. No management is management. It's just are you trying to get to a point to do things. And I think with turkeys, we've probably allowed our timber to mature differently. Um, it's overstocked. It's probably not producing acorns. We've probably got too many deer on our landscape in a lot of places. Um, so, so that's impacting other things that are going on again on that landscape level because we manage habitats. We really don't manage the species. The species is the byproduct 
of what we're doing with the habitats. And if we're managing our habitats well, the species will react to that. So, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you guys are confused. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> we're thinking. Those are gears. Those okay. are gears. Okay. You know, we're talking about it. So we, uh, we constantly, both formally and probably informally, probably do comparisons of our two properties. And our properties are different mm -hmm. in how they are laid out, if you will. And so that's what I was thinking about is, is I, I probably have a lot more white tail on my property, but he has like trophy turkeys. Mm -hmm. uh, his wife shot like a 29 pounder last year. And the year before is like a 28 pounder. Wow. I mean, so it's not a one time thing, mm -hmm. but you go to my place and my place, the turkeys, I, I probably have two year olds. I mean, they're not, they're not monstrous turkeys. I have a few, but not like the numbers he has. And, and that's one thing to really keep in mind with all of our wildlife. It's not evenly distributed across the landscape. Things are different in different places. And it might be just be for whatever reason where you're at in the composition of the tree species or just the south, more south-facing slope so it warms up a little bit quicker and the birds maybe get to nest a week earlier than some places. Something that maybe we don't even know what it is yet doesn't mean that it has to be the same at your place as it is. It's taking that step back and observing, saying, what are the things that I can manipulate that will allow me to get to where I want to, and I hate to say the word quicker, but in a timely manner. Because sure. with timber, nothing's quick. No. <laughs> you know, it takes time, and it takes planning, and it takes effort to put those things on the landscape. And sometimes we get caught up, and we want that instantaneous fix. And that's, that's tough to do. But there's things that we can do. Yeah. Annually. yeah. We'll have to do an episode on that yeah. coming up. So, um, 2021, you know, uh, turkey season's right around the corner. No real changes that I'm aware of from last year or kind of previous years. No regulation changes for this year. Um, but COVID's still in the picture. And, and COVID had a huge impact on turkeys last year, um, not just in Iowa, but across the nation. It was probably the first big, wow, COVID impacted how we live as, as people. And what we quickly found out was that it was a great way to socially distance ourselves. A lot of people had, I won't say free time because a lot of people were still working, but they could work differently than they had in the past. And so people got outside and we saw, a, we saw about a 25% increase in the number of people out last spring and in our harvest last year. 20%. 20%. 2025. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It depends wow. on what part of the state you look at. And how. So, do you envision, uh, envision any changes? And if so, what would those changes So you're be? back to my pessimistic I optimism. Know, I know. I is know. I'm really hoping that people take that deep breath and say, wow, I enjoyed last year. I'm going to get out this year because life is slowly transitioning back to what it used to be. But I think we really saw people get out and enjoy nature for the first time. We kind of slowed ourselves down, not intentionally. We had to do it. Um, so now they're like, you know, I enjoy turkey hunting. I'm going to go back out and, and do that again or, or, you know, mushroom hunt or whatever it is and spend some time with my family. And really hoping we see people carry that through this. Like I control my time and I want to spend my time outdoors. Yeah. So I'm envisioning that there are going to be more people out there. But the pessimistic side of me is we did not have great turkey production two years ago. And it tends to be our two-year-old gobblers are the ones that really are kind of the carry the carry the mail. You know, they like to gobble a lot and they're active and they move around. So we might see a few less turkeys on the landscape of that two-year-old category. Um, but what we know about turkey hunters is most turkey hunters think they want to kill a turkey. But what they really want to hear is, See, what they really want to have happen is hear a turkey gobble and have a reasonable chance of getting that turkey close enough. Yeah, I always tell people, you know, I love it's my favorite season to go because even if I don't get a turkey, which is about 50 50, <laughs> I've never counted it up, but it's uh, not every year. No. Uh, but just being able to get out, things are greening up, you see things, you hear things, it's just amazing. Turkey hunting is a great observational pastime because the mornings the turkeys aren't gobbling you know they're still there they're just not gobble that morning but you're seeing the first warbler of the spring come through you're seeing a pileated woodpecker pecking on a tree you've got that squirrel running up and down you know and all That's of a sudden when a when a when a squirrel comes down the tree behind you or a bird lands on the bill of your cap and those things and you go back and i always tell this story about my my oldest daughter the first time i took her turkey hunting 
And it's one of those things that will stick with you your entire life. Is I got her up, and of course she was young, and and uh, um, it's hard to get a young kid up at that time of the day. And we go out, and I'm sitting there, and I tell her, I said, now we're going to face east. And I said, you watch when that sun comes up. And I said, and then you count. In eight minutes, you're going to feel that sun rays hit you. And so the sun comes up, and then eight minutes goes by, and you feel those first rays warming you up. And she's sitting there. And she leans over. She goes, Dad, she goes, this is amazing. And I said, Allison, <laughs> it happens every day. <laughs> you know, and it's just that realization that she was enjoying something that no one else was at that time of the day. But it's such an amazing thing, and it happens every day. And she is in the moment. Yeah, let's just go out there and enjoy it. You know, and turkeys are an excuse to get out there and enjoy that sunshine come up. And we love to hear those hoot owls, and the transition from the nighttime animals to the daytime animals, and, and watching the deer come by, and that walks a lot closer than during deer season. That's, ex- <laughs> yeah. that's exactly right. I mean, that, what you just described, it's exactly how it transpires to you. Yeah, or what's worse is you got deers and turkey coming in you're like gosh i hope those deer don't mess up That's my too turkey many eyes. <laughs> <laughs> too many eyes and deer have noses and, you know, and that's what makes it fun yeah is that i and we will talk if we talk a little bit about turkey hunting is i call it the dance it literally is a dance is we're messing with the biology of a turkey and the biology of a turkey is is the male stays put he gobbles he struts and he brings the females to him but we as hunters are sitting in a spot trying to get a male to come to us that's imitating the female. And thousands of years of biology tells him, no, stand here and she comes to me. And now it becomes a battle of willpower of who gives up first and who doesn't. And that's the dance. And we've all had that where a gobbler will come in and then he'll turn and he'll go away because he says, no, you're supposed to come to me. And we're like, no, you just need to come a little closer. to me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, maybe that's a good segue into the social aspects of turkeys. You know, we talked mm-hmm. about toms and we've, you know, there's obviously hens and we talked about pullets, right? Yeah. And what, um, within that structure, what does a typical turkey, um, turkey social environment look like? So, so again, there's throughout, I, I talk turkeys all day. Yeah. So it's like here. a six hour podcast, right? But what we realize is that, that turkeys want to be social birds. They're social animals because they're safety in numbers. Those heads are bobbing. The eyes are they're, they're a, a, a species, a, a prey species because their eyes are on the side of their head. So they're looking. They don't see distance well. They, they don't have perspective, but they can see movement really well, which makes it tough for us as turkey hunters. We all know that you can't move at the wrong time. Um, but those hens want to go to that male and, and be bred and then go off. But then they become very antisocial. When they go to a nest, they're by themselves. And they want to be isolated. And they want to raise that poult. And they don't want to move off that nest because they've got the predators and all those things. Everything loves an egg. You know, nature, everything loves to eat eggs. So they want to be out there and be isolated to try to make sure that that nest becomes successful. And this becomes the hard part for us in Iowa because we're farmers. We know that when we have a cow and it's bred, we're going to have a calf. Or when we raise a chicken, we're going to get this much out of it. But in nature, it's like, good luck. That's you right. Know, a bunch of you are going to try and a whole bunch of you are going to fail. And what I tell people is if we had 100% nest success, I'd be getting a lot more phone calls that say, what are we going to do about all these turkeys? I wait too many turkeys. Right. So nature kind of balances that out from year to year force. And what we see is about 50, if, if we have 50% nest success, that's a great year. In reality, it's like 25 to 30% nest success. Hmm. So, And that would be a normal year for us. But Mother Nature has balanced that out, that if we have a normal year, we only need this many poles to carry carry through. Interesting. Yeah. So back to that social part. So again, then they're going to be antisocial as they're doing the nesting. But as soon as they raise those poles or those poles hatch, they're going to start congregating back to those brooding areas, which on many many farms that becomes a limiting factor having good brooding areas on your on your property so that's something we always talk about with landowners and then as those are good areas other hens are going to come to those areas and they're going to just socially start to congregate and that creates those gang broods and as they start to gang brood then then the survival rate goes way up and what we typically say then is once a turkey gets past four to six weeks they basically have the same survival rate as an adult at that point. So four to six weeks doesn't seem like very long. No, but, but, they're, they're, but they're growing tremendously fast. And the real kicker is about 10 to 14 days because a turkey cannot fly until about 10 days. And at 10 days, they're going to start to hop, get up off the ground. And when they can start to night roost, then their survival rates will go way, way Makes up. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Their predator numbers are, are, are diminished quite a bit then. So maybe... 
And this is a question in the back of my mind, giving me a little hunting knowledge and tips going into this season. So uh, how many, you know, they roost, my experience mm -hmm. is your turkeys are going to roost together yep. or in groups, yep. right? Is that what you call them? Groups or yeah. pods? Flocks. Or flocks. Mm -hmm. There you go. What's a typical flock? Is there a number around that? Not really. It's it's going to be related to the, the habitat, the space. Um, you know, I, I've hunted farms where there's literally three cottonwood trees. So every turkey that's going to be in that, you know, 300 acres is going to be roosted in those same three trees. Sure. But on a, on a habitat in southern Iowa where it's a lot of big oak trees, especially with the big wolf oak trees, the roosting trees, they could be spread out over several trees. But the advantage is, is this is why a gobbler gobbles at night, is he flies up and he gobbles and those hens are like, oh, we want to be bred in the morning or we want to be around, you know, th this breeding dominant male. So they'll all want to kind of basically flock up together. And that could be several trees, but it'll be in the same drainage or the same hillside or something. Then he's going to gobble in the morning to let everybody know it's time to start our day. And when he flies down, we've all been there. It's like, oh, I'm going to get this turkey. He's right there. And then we watch five, six, seven, eight hens fly right down to they him. They disappear. And, Only if it were that easy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And then we take a nap because there's nothing to do for the next two hours. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they're, they're a unique social bird. Um, but it's in, in the springtime, it's all based upon on that, on that breeding. And it's, it's, I put it very similarly to like the rut, the fall rut. Is you know, there's a limited window when that can happen. And that buck has got to you know, be prepared. He's got, to, he's got to establish his dominance. He's got to be ready so that the does are there. And it can all happen because he's got a, such a short window to make it happen. Tim, questions? No, I've been asking them. This has been great. Yeah, so I think I've got one question. I know you have one. Well, the question. armadillo. Yeah, you gotta I got to get to the got... armadillo question. So. <laughs> I, got, I got squashed on that before. But <laughs> no, do, we have arm do we have armadillos? So we do have armadillos in Iowa. The, the key thing there is, is that we have no idea of how many armadillos there are, and we're not quite sure um, to the extent of where they're at. So a few years ago, many years ago, we would get an occasional armadillo report. And we would always put it in the category of that it came up from the south on a produce truck or something like that. Um, but then we just started getting a little more frequent, and a little more odd, and things like that. So we were at a meeting one time, and we were talking just jokingly about armadillos, and, and but we should be documenting this, you know, to say, because we, if you look at armadillo data, armadillo research, They've been progressing out of Mexico for the last hundred years and moving north. And there's some papers that talk about mid Iowa, lower Minnesota might be their, their traditional or be their new range latitudinally. So we were talking about documenting this. And, and I finally said, you know, I'm the southernmost biologist in the state. I'll probably be the one that encounters them first. I'll just designate myself the state armadillo biologist. Just, sure. And then from there it's grown because now I get all the reports and I keep a database. And, and last year I think we had about 30 reports um, of which I think 20 some were live. Trail cam pictures, things like that. Huh. And then of course the, the road kills and the things like that come in. So we just try to document how that's occurred. Now, are they bad for the habitat here? So they're grubbers. They eat a lot of insects and they do a lot of digging. And down south, they get a lot of bad reputation for destroying nests, um, not because they're going after the nest, but because they're just constantly grubbing and looking for things. Mm -hmm. So they can get into some ground nesting bird issues. The numbers that we have, no, they're, they're not going to be. It's just right now kind of more of a novelty um, to see. And, and then how will they adapt to our landscape? So if I'm a hunter and I see an armadillo, what's, uh, wh what am I able or can I do? You can take a picture of it and send it to me and say, wow, I saw an armadillo in Southern <laughs> Iowa. There's really not, you know, they're not going to attack you. They're not, nothing like that. And it's nothing to be really worried about um, per se from a management standpoint. It's just right now a kind of a unique thing. More importantly, what I'm hoping to do is just document it because then this adds to our knowledge about the species, about how are they moving north. And, and can we correlate that with some other thing? Is that a habitat change thing? Is that a... Uh, climate change uh, issue, or is it the fact that the guy that wrote the paper 75, 80 years ago was right that here will be the northern range of armadillos? We've watched them moving through Mexico, moving through um, Texas, up through Arkansas, um, and so we've just been documenting that. Now, now I know someone's going to ask if can I shoot shoot it? Good question. Um, 
I've never had anybody ask me that question and we don't have an armadillo season. So right now I would say they're probably protected as a non-game species, mm -hmm. but since it's not listed as a species in Iowa, it might not have any status. So I guess I wouldn't encourage anyone to shoot one. There's no yep. reason to shoot one, yep. um, but it'd be something I'd have to check into. I'm just thinking there'd be somebody that's like, gosh, I want to have it mounted. You know, yeah. I can see somebody wanting to do that. Usually those are the ones that get picked up on the side of the road. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the unique thing about armadillos is their escape mechanism is to jump. So they jump and they jump about three to four feet before they curl into a ball. And if you look at where the bumper of an F4 250 is, it's about three feet off the ground. So most of them jump actually, they'll jump up into the undercarriage of a vehicle and get killed. That way. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of what we see are road kills along the interstate. There's one topic, turkey related, mm -hmm. that's come up on several episodes in the past, and it's uh, this correlation between inverse correlation between turkeys and and pheasants. Mm -hmm. Have you have you heard of such a thing? And the, and the theory is, hey, turkeys will kill baby pheasants or kill pheasants. Yeah. And is that true? And that's in Iowa. Uh, first time I've heard it, in Iowa. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm joking because in Iowa, turkeys kill pheasants. In Pennsylvania, turkeys kill grouse. <laughs> yeah. In the West, turkeys kill quail. In the South, turkeys kill quail. And it just becomes the local lore. Yeah. Of wherever exactly. you have, whatever part of the country you're in, and where you have turkeys and where you used to have some other species, they must compete. They're killers. And the reality is, is no, it's not. Is, is what I try to tell people is, is that that is back to our habitat issue. Where we have turkeys today that we didn't used to have turkeys is because the habitat has changed. And if you don't have pheasants or you don't have quail there, take a step back. That quail habitat is probably not quail habitat anymore. Those That, that plum thicket has grown up into elms and hickories and oaks. It's 40 years older. Now, if you want quail back, we can give you some great tips on how to hinge cut and do some things. And you'll probably have both species there to some extent. But it's not the, the adage where the turkey's finding and eating the baby quail or he's stomping on the nests and breaking the eggs to compete for that. It's it's a habitat issue. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And consistent, I want you to get that I think out. pretty least, consistent message we're yeah. getting from three different people. Yeah, so. And make that out there as much as you can because yeah. I'll get that phone call today, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim, I've got one more final question, but anything we haven't covered that you want to I'm good. cover? Um, Jim, from your standpoint, any. One final question for me. Anything that we haven't covered that we should talk no, about? No, I just what I want to do is some of the things we talked about before we had the podcast. What I always encourage people is just be observational. And don't be afraid to call your local biologist or myself because we're not in the field every day. When you see something that's unique, we want to hear about it. You guys are the eyes and the ears of what's happening on the landscape. Um, and, and if it's something that we can answer a question for, that's great. Or if it's something that just gets documented so we can say, hey, what's happening? It gives us a heads up sure. um, so we can start to understand things. Okay. Um, I think you mentioned you're a hunter, mm -hmm. hunter also. So we, we try to ask all our guests uh, a similar question. And the question is, you know, while outdoors and hunting, mm -hmm. um, what's the craziest, goofiest thing you've seen or had happen to you? And maybe not such a good way, yeah. uh, kind of. A Think deal. of it as a dumbass moment. You ever well, had a dumbass and moment? Stories that yeah, absolutely. And, and most of them are related to turkey hunting. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I'll do, I, I'm actually doing a, a turkey seminar next week with the DNR through our, our uh, virtual imaging. And I always say to turkey hunters, the beauty of hunting with a mentor hunter is you don't have to make the mistakes your mentor hunter made because he's not going to allow you to do that. I've left my tags in the truck. I've dropped my shells in the river. I've, you know, forgotten equipment that I should have. And those were all those oops moments that you're like, well, I'll never do that again. Um, but, but what I really like to think about my experience of all species that I hunt is, again, it's that observational stuff. Some of the best turkey hunting moments I've had have never involved a turkey. It's having that bird land on the bill of your cap or seeing things happen that you wouldn't see because you're out there turkey hunting. That's your excuse to be there, but there's nothing else going on. So you just watch nature and you see what's happening. I've seen turkeys fall off logs. I've seen coons fall out of trees. Um, <laughs> things that probably happen every day. If there was a YouTube channel for dumb things that happen with wildlife, you know, it'd be fun to watch it. But just watching those funny, goofy yeah, things Yeah, that's happen, great. Yeah, it's you know. funny. Well, thank you for being on the podcast and a great wealth of, you know, information, especially around turkeys. And man, it, I'm getting the itch now. Just listen to this, right? It's right around the corner. But um, Tim, with that, you know, be, be safe, safe, have fun, fun and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.
Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.